Hello everyone, my name is Felipe and I live in Giap in the Chapada Diamantina region in the state of Bahia. What I'm about to share happened to me, my brother, and a cousin of ours back in 2005 when we went camping at a waterfall in Fortaleza. We arrived there around 5 in the afternoon to enjoy the day and set things up. Around 6 o'clock, we lit the campfire and roasted some meat. After that, we went fishing until late at night. When we returned from fishing, it was around midnight and that's when we began to notice a rotten smell, like carrion. We found it very strange because when we first arrived there was no smell at all. We decided to find out where the smell was coming from. We grabbed our weapons and ventured into the woods. As we moved further in, we saw some animal bones and pieces of rotten meat that seemed to have been there for a long time. However, as I mentioned, when we first got to the campsite, we didn't notice any such smell. We stayed there, observing the scene when we started hearing noises nearby. It sounded like a heavy animal approaching. At that moment, our cousin suggested that we move toward the sound to see what kind of animal it was. We continued deeper into the woods until we came across an abandoned mud hut. The most surprising thing wasn't finding that little house in the middle of nowhere, but what was standing in front of it. Right in front of the door was a creature. Its posture made it look like it was searching for something. Suddenly, the thing started sniffing the air. We were close by but hidden behind trees. Then, it looked in our direction as if it had caught our scent, and we finally saw what the creature really looked like. It resembled a hellish abomination, like something out of a horror movie. We were frozen, staring at the thing. Suddenly, it began to walk toward us. That's when my brother Eduardo cocked his 12-gauge shotgun and fired at the creature. At that moment, our cousin also cocked his gun and shot. The creature fell to the ground, making a terrifying sound that would chill the soul of any brave man. We immediately started running back to the campsite. We left everything behind and only grabbed our backpacks. The car was about one kilometer away, hidden on the side of the road, and we managed to reach it. The next day, we returned to the campsite to retrieve our belongings, and when we arrived, a very strange old man was looking through our stuff. Instantly, we thought he might be the creature, but before we could accuse him of anything, he asked if we had fled from the werewolf. When we confirmed, he told us that the creature was an old man who wandered through those woods, but his intention was never to harm anyone. The creature had taken two shots, and we didn't know if it had survived. We just grabbed the rest of our things and left that place, never to return. Hello, I'll go by the name Anna here. I live in Rio de Janeiro and what I'm about to share happened to me, my mother and my grandmother about 20 years ago, around three in the afternoon. At that time we lived on a small farm. My mother and grandmother went out to gather wood to fix a damaged fence. I decided to go with them so I wouldn't be alone at home. I went barefoot because I liked the feeling of the earth under my feet. When we arrived at the spot there was plenty of wood. I ended up stepping on a thorn in the grass and started yelling. At that moment my mother asked me to stop making noise because the neighbor's dog, which was very aggressive, might hear us and come over to attack. Just a few seconds later, we saw a large yellow dog with blood-stained stripes. Seeing it approaching, we quickly grabbed the wood and went back home. Later that same night, we were fixing the fence when suddenly I heard some howls. At first, I thought it was just any dog and didn't pay much attention, but the howls continued. This time, I decided to look. When I looked at a specific spot in the woods, I saw a large black dog, and that thing was standing upright. 
I looked at my grandmother and she had a scared and alert expression. Our dog started barking and my mother whispering told us to go inside the house immediately. We brought the dog inside, locked all the doors and windows. After a few minutes, the howling stopped. After a while, we thought that thing had left, but then we started hearing shotgun blasts. At that same moment, we heard the creature's footsteps running into the forest. Then someone knocked on the door asking to come in. It was our neighbor. He said that thing had passed through his farm, and when he saw it heading our way, he grabbed his shotgun and came to help us. According to him, none of the shots he fired hit the creature, but they were enough to scare it away. Even so, that thing never appeared around here again. Good night. After a night full of laughter and dancing at the farm, Johnny and Claudio said goodbye to their friends as the full moon illuminated the field. The party had been vibrant, with infectious music and the joy of the rural people blending with the aroma of barbecue. However, with the clock striking past midnight, they needed to cross the dark sugarcane field, a journey that promised to be more frightening than they had anticipated. As they walked, the feeling of loneliness enveloped the two farmhands, with the tall sugarcane swaying in the wind. Johnny, always the more playful one, tried to keep the mood light, but the silence of the night and the growing darkness made him uneasy. Claudio, more reserved and observant, began to notice signs that something was watching them from the shadows, which heightened the tension of the moment. Suddenly, a long howl cut through the cold air, freezing the two friends in their tracks. The werewolf, a creature feared in local legends, appeared before them, with its glowing eyes and claws ready to attack. Adrenaline surged, and Johnny and Claudio, on instinct, ran, each with thoughts on how to survive that nightmare. Their strategy was simple, stay together and find a safe place. They weaved through the cane, knowing that if they separated, their chances of escaping would be minimal. Claudio, in a moment of bravery, suggested they use the moonlight's reflections to distract the creature, creating misleading shadows that might confuse the werewolf in its pursuit. After a desperate run, they managed to find shelter in a small abandoned cabin, where the smell of aged wood mixed with the fear they felt. There in the darkness, they reflected on the courage needed to face the unknown. Their luck was that it was already well past midnight. As the sun began to rise and the colors of dawn appeared on the horizon, the creature finally left them in peace. They returned home, aware that they had been close to death. The sugarcane field, once feared, was now remembered fondly as it had saved their lives. The memory of that night will never be erased and anyone on a dawn in a remote place could experience the same. Good night. My name is Carlos, and this story I'm about to tell is how my life turned into a nightmare. It all began on a summer night while I was strolling through the narrow streets of a small town in the countryside. My wife Anna and I were on vacation, enjoying the tranquility of the place. That night we came across a gypsy setting up a tent in the main square. She was offering palm readings and future predictions. Anna, always curious, decided it would be fun. I, on the other hand, never believed in such things, but to please her, I agreed to join her. The gypsy was a woman with piercing eyes and a mysterious voice. She first took my hand. Her fingers were long and wrinkled, tracing the lines on my palm while she murmured some words in a language I didn't understand. Suddenly she stopped, looked me directly in the eyes and said, I see a black shadow in your future, a curse that will change your life. You will become a werewolf on the next full moon. I started laughing, thinking it was all nonsense. I thanked the gypsy and pulled my wife, who now seemed worried. In the days that followed, I didn't think much of it, but I began to notice something strange. 
My shadow seemed different, longer and with outlines resembling those of a large dog. At first, I thought it was just my imagination, but as the days went by, the shadow became clearer and more distinct. One night, while looking in the mirror, I saw a shadow reflected behind me. Panic began to grow inside me. I remembered the gypsy's words and, fearing for Anna's safety, decided I needed to stay away on the next full moon. On the night of the full moon, I went to a forest where no one would be, far from town. I didn't know exactly what to expect, but the fear of hurting my wife motivated me to isolate myself. I found a clearing, tied myself to a tree, and waited. The fear and tension were unbearable, and soon I began to feel terrible pain coursing through my body. My skin burned. My bones seemed to break and shift. The last conscious thought I had was the horrible sound of my own screams. When I woke up, I was naked, covered in mud and dried blood. The scene around me was completely different. I was no longer in the clearing where I had tied myself. I was in an unknown part of the forest, among trees I had never seen. The sense of disorientation and fear was simply terrifying. With great effort, I found my way back to where I had started, found my car, and drove home. When I arrived, Anna greeted me with tears in her eyes. I was exhausted and began to tell her everything, from the gypsy to my transformation. She listened, holding my hand tightly. We decided that to avoid future tragedies, I would create an isolation plan for all full moon nights. I bought an old abandoned cabin in the middle of the forest. I built a sturdy cell in the basement, and every month, on the night of the full moon, I lock myself in there, waiting for the transformation and praying that this curse will one day end. Living like this is not easy. The fear of hurting someone, the pain of the transformation, and the isolation are hard to bear. But Anna stays with me, and that's what gives me strength. Over time, I've learned to accept this condition, but I still hope that one day, somehow, I can break this curse. But for now, my life is a constant battle against the beast within me. And that's how, at least for now, I go on living my life. Good night. In 1987, I was about to turn 20 years old. My father at that time was 47. We were a family of six. Me, my father, my mother, and three siblings. My father always liked farms and country estates, these places surrounded by bush to live in. As he had always lived with his parents in the countryside and maintained this habit. He didn't like the city. His thing was the bush and we were also accustomed to living in such places. As a local resident, I had the habit of going to various places around there, including bars and knew a lot of people. One day I met a girl at one of the nearby bars who had moved to a nearby farm with her parents. I remember that as soon as I saw her, it was love at first sight, and she returned my gaze with a beautiful smile. After some time, we started dating. Her name is Rose Angela, and she is my current wife. She lived about 150 meters from the bar. Because of that, I started going back and forth to her house during the days, nights, and even late nights. Everything was fine, but things started getting strange when a caretaker arrived to look after a farmhouse next to my father's estate. The new caretaker was known as Naldo, his wife's name was Vera, and he had twin girls who were around nine years old. They weren't very talkative, they always had a serious look on their faces. As usual, whenever I got off work, I would go to the bar to chat with the guys and then stop by my father-in-law's house to see my girlfriend, Rosangela. It was a Friday night. I was having a few beers with my father-in-law, and I lost track of time. When I looked at the clock, it was almost one o'clock in the morning. 
My mother-in-law told me to stay overnight since it was late and that would have been the right thing to do. But I didn't want to overstay my welcome. I didn't want them to think I was taking advantage. As I was approaching the gate of my father's estate, I saw a dark figure, and to my surprise, my father was also at the gate. I ran to him, and he told me that something was circling the house and had run towards the gate. But now I couldn't see the figure anymore. My father and I could only hear the sound of something running through the bush. It was simply terrifying. My father had his gun ready, but he didn't dare shoot without being sure of what was there. After all, it could have been a person. We thought it best to go back home and leave it at that since we weren't sure what it was. The next day, we returned to the gate and looked around in the bush where we had heard the creature pass. There was a lot of flattened bush and disturbed earth. It was something very heavy that had passed through there. My mother spent weeks thanking God that my father and I had returned safely home that night. Unfortunately, we didn't find out what it was, but from what we heard and the figures we saw, it's very likely that it was a werewolf and that the new caretaker had something to do with it. The caretaker stayed for about five years looking after the farmhouse and then, for a reason we don't know, he was fired. To tell the truth, we all thought it was for the best because we were absolutely certain that that strange, silent man was indeed a werewolf. Good night. What I'm going to report happened in March of last year. My neighbor, who was 19 years old, had always been a very beautiful girl. She had met a guy named Andre, who was already 27 at the time. The two started dating and became increasingly close. I remember that their relationship was going very well. Sometimes she would go to his house, other times he would come to hers but something started to bother her. The guy would disappear sometimes, staying about a week without any news. Sometimes he claimed to be sick, other times he said he was volunteering on a trip, and on other occasions, he stated that he was traveling for work. He always had a different excuse. And, when he reappeared, he was injured, with bruises and scratches without any plausible explanation. Andre lived alone, and my neighbor decided to investigate what was happening with him. One month, he said he was going to travel for work and, as usual, would be gone for about a week. My neighbor went to his house secretly and saw that the lights were on. She thought of several possibilities. She could be being cheated on, or he could be involved in something illegal. On the afternoon of the 15th, she decided to surprise him. She went to his house and he was there, haggard with a sickly appearance, deep dark circles under his eyes, scratches and cuts all over his body. The house was a mess. There were no dirty dishes or food leftovers, but everything was turned upside down. Clothes were thrown around, glass and decorative objects were broken on the floor, even the living room TV was on the floor with a broken screen, and the sofas were torn. Seeing all this, my neighbor panicked and started bombarding Andre with questions. He only said that the trip had been postponed, that he didn't inform her because he was sick and didn't want to worry her, and that she shouldn't be there because it wasn't safe. He asked her to leave, but my neighbor became increasingly worried and insisted that she wouldn't leave. She said she would clean up the mess in the house and take care of him. She put Andre to bed against his will and started to tidy up the mess. Even though she was going against his wishes, Andre eventually fell asleep. He was very weak. Around 11 at night, my neighbor had already finished tidying up the mess. At a certain point, she was in the kitchen making something for Andre when she heard heavy breathing behind her. 
The first thing she thought was that someone had broken into the house, even though she was sure she had locked the gate properly. As the wall fences were quite high, there was no way someone could jump over them without drawing attention. Besides, the street dogs wouldn't stop barking, which made everything even stranger. When she turned around, she saw that it was Andre behind her. His eyes were bloodshot, as if he had suffered a stroke. He had a strange glow in his eyes, shirtless and staggering through the kitchen. She ran to help him and saw that he was burning with fever. She decided it was best to take him to the hospital, but Andre pushed her away violently and started shouting for her to leave. He was no longer the Andre she knew. He would never act like that. Andre let out an agonizing scream, as if he were tearing his flesh from the inside out. He started convulsing, knocking over everything in his path, howling in pain. He could no longer speak. She was terrified, not knowing what to do. She began to pray and tried to call someone. That's when she saw Andre's arms breaking one after the other. She realized that something macabre was happening. Overcome with fear, she saw Andre transforming into a beast. She ran out of the house, leaving the creature behind, which now bore no resemblance to her boyfriend. When she was already on the street, running, she heard a howl coming from the house. She says she hid under a car, paralyzed with fear, and just prayed to stay alive. Finally, the creature disappeared into the darkness of the streets, heading to an unknown place. Andre never looked for her again, and she, out of fear, didn't look for him either. About two months later, she received a call from Andre's father. He didn't identify himself, called from a restricted number, but she recognized his voice. The man only informed her that Andre had moved to another state and was unreachable, and that he thanked her for her discretion. The worst part is that my neighbor discovered that she was pregnant with Andre's child. The boy has already been born, and she is totally terrified, thinking that perhaps her son might turn into a werewolf. But that only when the boy grows up will we find out. Good night. I went to visit my grandparents who live in the countryside. I had been there only a few times with my parents, and after becoming an adult I decided to return alone. Shortly after turning 20, I went to spend a weekend with them because they live there alone and have no one to bring them to the city. I went to their farm on a Friday. When I arrived, it was a joyful occasion, as they don't often receive visitors. It was the period of Lent, and a full moon. We talked, laughed, and had a lot of fun. I chopped wood and milked cows with my grandfather, who despite his age is still very strong and healthy. As soon as it got dark, we had dinner. In the countryside, it's common to go to bed early, so shortly after dinner we went to bed. There's no internet there, so there wasn't much to do. I soon fell asleep. The next day, we woke up very early. I woke up feeling well rested because I had slept very well. I spent another day following my grandfather's routine helping him, and when night fell everything started. We were in the living room, and suddenly my grandfather began to scream and fell to the floor writhing in pain. My grandmother told me to run and lock myself in the bedroom. I didn't understand anything as the normal reaction would be to help him, but I obeyed. However, I didn't lock the door. I left it slightly ajar and watched. I swear I saw my grandfather's arms and legs bend. He started to transform into something I couldn't explain. My grandmother ran, opened the porch door, and then came running towards where I was. She locked the bedroom door and told me to stay quiet. 
When I looked through the keyhole, I saw an animal the size of a calf running out through the door my grandmother had opened, disappearing into the darkness. I was in shock. My grandmother tried to calm me down. The next day, I packed my things early to leave before my grandfather returned. Before I left, my grandmother told me that my grandfather suffered from a curse and begged me to keep it a secret and not tell anyone in the family. I left and never returned, until now. But I decided to honor my grandmother's request and haven't told even my parents about this story. Good night. My name is Humberto. I am a hunter of vintage cars, a collector. Since I was young, I have always been fascinated by rare and historic automobiles. My target in the story I will tell was a Volkswagen SP2, a rare Brazilian sports car from the 70s that I dreamed of restoring. After months of relentless searching, a lead took me to an isolated farm in the interior of Minas Gerais. I received information that the owner, a farmer named Mr. Antunes, had an abandoned SP2 on his land. I contacted him and he confirmed the story, inviting me to visit him to see the car. I could barely contain my excitement as I drove to the farm. I arrived in the late afternoon. The farm was surrounded by dense forest, and Mr. Antunes, a tall man with a graying beard, greeted me with a firm handshake. The car is in the middle of the woods around the farm. It will be difficult to get there, but I can take you, he said with a smile. I agreed, and we set off in his truck. The path was rough filled with potholes and rocks. We arrived at a clearing, and there it was, the Volkswagen SP2, covered in leaves and dust, but still intact with its elegant body and classic lines. My eyes lit up. There it is! I exclaimed, inspecting the car up close. It's perfect for restoration. We negotiated the price and quickly came to an agreement. I was elated. I paid Mr. Antunes right there, and he suggested I come to pick up the car at night, saying it was a quieter time to avoid curious onlookers. Come at night with a tow truck. It will be safer and more discreet, he advised. I found the suggestion strange, but didn't want to argue. I called a friend who worked with a tow truck and we arranged to return to the farm at 11 p.m. When we arrived, the night was silent, except for the sounds of crickets and the wind. As my friend Carlos, the tow truck operator, and I walked towards the SP2, a sense of unease began to grow within me. Suddenly, a deep and frightening howl echoed through the night. I looked at Carlos and saw fear in his eyes. What was that? He asked nervously. Before I could answer, a huge shadow emerged from the trees, a grotesque creature with fur all over its body. The creature quickly advanced on us with terrifying speed. Run! I shouted, and we split up trying to evade it. The werewolf attacked Carlos, who fought desperately to defend himself. Trembling with fear, I found a rusty piece of metal on the ground and ran towards the creature, shouting and swinging the metal with all my might. For a moment, I managed to drive it away from Carlos, but I knew we didn't have much time. We fought the creature and ran. Adrenaline kept us alive. Finally, we reached the tow truck and sped away, leaving the beast behind. My heart was pounding like a drum. 
but we were alive. We reached the city and immediately went to the hospital to treat Carlos's injuries. While he was being attended to, I couldn't stop reflecting on the attack. Something didn't add up. The next morning I returned to the farm, this time with the police. When we arrived, we found Mr. Antunes at his house, showing surprise at seeing us. You came back early, he said, trying to be casual. I explained the attack, but his expression changed to something darker and more defensive. The police, suspicious, searched the property and found some evidence linking the farmer to the attack. We discovered that Antunes used the legend of the werewolf to scare away curious people and deceive buyers, receiving money and never delivering the car. The farmer was arrested, and I finally managed to take the Volkswagen SP2, which was now safe in my garage, ready to be restored. Now, whenever I look at the fully restored SP2, I remember that terrifying night I had to endure to get this car. Good night. That night was one of the most frightening of my life. Viv and I manage our farm in the countryside, a peaceful and isolated place we considered our sanctuary. But on that dark night, an unwelcome visitor appeared to test our courage. It all started with strange noises around the house, sounds of heavy footsteps, growls, and a scent in the air. Viviane and I were having dinner when we first heard these sounds. Initially, we thought it was a wild animal, perhaps a wolf, but something told us it was something worse. I went to the window and could barely believe what I saw. Under the dim moonlight, I spotted a large, hairy figure moving among the shadows. Its physique suggested supernatural strength. I had no doubt. It was a werewolf, a creature I never imagined seeing, even while living on a farm. When Vivian saw it, her expression of terror confirmed my suspicions. We stayed very quiet, and after some time, the creature left without trying to enter the house. We couldn't ignore it. The next day, we decided to act before the creature returned. We grabbed as many boards as we could find and started reinforcing our doors and windows. It was a race against time before the next night. Every nail hammered was an effort to ensure our safety and that of our home. When we finished, it felt like we had an improvised fortress. We were exhausted, but now safer. The following night we waited for it to return. We were in the same spot in front of the wood stove when we heard a terrifying howl. Shortly after hearing the howl, the werewolf was back at our farm. Our hearts raced, but we remained steadfast. The creature began to circle the house trying to find a way in. It scratched its prey at some parts of the doors and windows but now it would be at least three times harder for the creature to get in. The night dragged on, each moment feeling like an eternity of fear and tension. But to our relief, the boards proved to be our salvation. The werewolf, after several failed attempts, left again, disappearing into the darkness of the night. Vivian and I hugged each other, relieved and grateful that we had stood firm, our house was intact, although it was surrounded by all that wood. We left the boards there for a while, and after a few weeks, after confirming that the creature would not return, we removed the boards. 
Since then, we've been armed, but we haven't seen the werewolf again. We told this story to the neighbors and local authorities, but many still don't believe it and think it was just an urban legend. Many of our neighbors don't have weapons inside their homes. Vivian and I are prepared in case the creature ever returns. Good night. That night started like so many others we had spent together, Veronica and I. In our quest for adventure and moments of relaxation, we decided to camp in a secluded clearing surrounded by trees and a nearby stream. Bottles of wine, laughter echoing through the night as we celebrated our bond and the freedom that nature offered. Laughter and toasts mixed together our hearts carefree amidst nature. Suddenly, we began to hear strange sounds, branches breaking in the forest. At first, we thought it might be wild animals or even our imagination fueled by alcohol. But as the night progressed and the wine bottles emptied, the sounds became more frequent and distinct. Veronica and I exchanged glances with a slight concern but our drunken courage still kept us optimistic and somewhat unaware. That's when we started hearing human voices, or at least they sounded like it. Restless whispers, as if someone were watching us, playing with us. Our initial reaction was nervous laughter, attributing the voices to possible locals trying to scare us or even some psychological effect of the alcohol and the darkness. Veronica, with her fearless nature, suggested we investigate, claiming we wouldn't let any ghost or local legend ruin our fun. We laughed together, ignoring the growing sense of unease creeping into our minds. Armed only with flashlights and courage, we ventured to the edge of the forest, making our laughter and banter an attempt to convince whoever was trying to scare us that it wasn't working. We made disconnected comments, the alcohol still warming our bodies, but something around us began to chill our minds. Something was moving among the trees, our flashlights capturing silhouettes we couldn't discern. Must be some local ritual, a tasteless prank, I exclaimed, trying to convince myself it was nothing serious. That's when we saw the creature for the first time just briefly among the tree shadows. It seemed like a distorted figure, but one that walked upright. My heart felt like it wanted to burst out of my chest. We ran back to the campsite, our steps clumsy and hurried wanting to save ourselves from something unknown. The voices pursued us, mimicking our own gasping breaths. They were getting closer and more real with each passing moment. Back in the clearing, illuminated by the firelight, we tried to spot any sign of the thing, but the clearing was empty. That's when we couldn't believe it. We heard Veronica's voice echoing through the forest, but she was right beside me. Our hearts froze as we looked at each other, hearing her voice saying nonsensical things through the woods. Paralyzed by terror, she only screamed, It's not me. Whatever that was, it was closing in on us. We had no idea what was happening. How could people trying to scare us mimic Veronica's voice? If it came through the forest, we would be easy prey. Our only option was to get into the tent and hold knives in case something tried to enter. However, nothing did. Something just seemed to be circling our campsite, emitting those sounds that seemed to come straight from hell. Until finally, 
All of that vanished with the darkness of the night giving way to dawn. In the first rays of sunlight, we got out of there as quickly as possible, leaving many of our things behind. I have no idea what that was, but knowing some legends, I strongly suspect it was a demon. Good night.